hello, hello, and welcome to Comic Book Herald Live. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Using, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. Today on CBH Live, we're going to talk comics, we're going to talk last week, we're going to talk this week, we're going to talk briefly, <laughs> as you may or may not be able to tell by the sound of my rumbling baritone. I am mildly ill today, very mild cold. Turns out if you go to several zoos with several tiny children, you will leave with an eventual cold. I'm going to see how long I can go. I'm going to see how long I can take this thing. I've got a bottle of water. I've got a cop drop. I just did hot water and honey. We'll see how long we can slowly and gently make our way through this thing. That is comic book reviews. Getting your questions, getting your thoughts, getting your comments here in the chat. I will review and talk to as many as I can today before we are ultimately done. But yeah, today we got last week's comics, Ultimate Spider-Man 3, Rise of the Powers of 10-3, God 6, X-Force number 50, the final issue in X-Force. I did read it. We will talk about it. Um, Immortal Thor today, and an Avengers tie-in to fall the House of X. So those are the Marvel books we'll be talking about. Got a great list of the best comics of March 2024. That is going up soon. That'll be out in the newsletter, the email newsletter this week. If you're curious how you can get access to that, go over to comicherald.com. You will find a sign-up to the CBH newsletter. I only bother you about once a month with a list of all of my favorite comics that month. I will also be publishing that same list on CBH eventually as well. Doing that every month, having a great time doing it. Uh, March was stacked. There was tons and tons of good stuff. Um, some familiar names. Mortal Thor had a first trade release. That's on there. Swan Songs book I've been talking about for a while. That's on there. A lot of new stuff. A lot of new stuff too. If you back Comic Book Herald over at patreon.com slash comic book herald, one of the benefits is you will get access um, to monthly. I share the anticipated release list. So if you cannot wait to see what I'm going to be reading and what I'm excited about month by month in terms of the best comics, I do have a private document that I share there um, and again, that's on patreon.com slash comic herald. If you are interested in supporting the site and the show and what I do here, you can back it there and, uh, and get access to that early. But otherwise, you know, it just goes out month by month. April is, April is ridiculously loaded, ridiculously loaded with like new graphic novels and books that I am excited to read, including there's a reprint of the first volume of a hundred bullets by Brian Azarello and... Oh, geez. Eduardo Riso. And uh, I've never read 100 Bullets. I, re I think I read like the first six issues. And I don't know. I just, for whatever reason, I stopped. And I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, sometime, maybe it won't be this next month, but sometime this year, I'm going to do the 100 Bullets thing. And a lot of people, you know, when I was asking for recommendations for folks who were like, what are the comics I should I should read that I can consider adding to the best comics of all time list? A lot, of folk, a lot of folks nominated 100 Bullets. So at some point, I got to do the whole thing. This last month, I did catch-up reads on Sex Criminals by Matt Fraction and Chip Zdarsky and also Descender by Jeff Lemire and Dustin Wynn. Both of those did make it. Both of those have new complete collections. Um, Sex Criminals spelled complete the way you'd expect of a book of that renown. And uh, it, I got to say, so Sex Criminals, it turns out, so I loved the first several issues. That was like 2014, image, golden age renaissance stuff, right? It was like, it was that moment between 2012 and 2015 where anybody who was anybody in comics, it felt like was launching like their best creator own work. You know, so you had like Saga launches around that time. You got East to West, Manhattan Projects from Hickman. You got Fraction and Sudarsky on Sex Criminals. It's from Wick Div, from Kieran Dillon and, and Jamie McKelvey and Rick Remender doing a whole host of things. A whole bunch of, whole bunch of stuff, right? whole bunch of creator own work. And um, yeah, so it, anyway, I, it turns out I had only read like the first eight issues. <laughs> it, it turns out I had only read like the first eight issues of Sex Criminals and then I just kept collecting it and I never finished it. Like I never actually, I never actually finished Sex Criminals. So I pulled out all 30 
plus two issues because there's a sexual Gary special and then there's an issue 69. They ended on issue 69, even though they came nowhere close to a 69 issue run, which is, you know, chef's kiss. Um, but I went and I, I read the whole thing and I got to say it holds up better than I expected. It holds up a lot better than I expected. Um, I had a great time catching up on sex criminals descender less. So I really enjoyed the sci-fi of it early on. Uh, and then I, I will admit I got a bit tired. I think Dustin Wynn's work is, is pretty incredible. Um, but I feel like Lemire ran out of, ran out of sci-fi about halfway through, still had the character beats, still had the emotion that, that Lemire is known for, but kind of, kind of ran out of concept, ran out of the, the actual Asimov of it all. Anyway, all that's coming. Uh, thanks to those of you who are here live. I did start super early. Again, I just want to get going while I have a semblance of a voice. So apologies to those who are going to be bothered. Uh, if it, I, I guess at 5.15, we should announce, hey, for those of you who came on time at the stated uh, beginning time and you're worried that you missed the classic singing introduction, don't. <laughs> don't worry. I did not sing today. My voice is too bothered. Maybe next week. Maybe next week. You know, nominate some songs. Nominate some some tunes that you all want to hear this start with next week. And I will ignore most of them, but I might check in on one. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's I know I'm early. <laughs> it's fine. Thanks to Brandon Jones here in the super chat, jumping in early to show support. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Brandon. Um, it does. It means a lot for, for folks who are, you know, somebody like me, just putting yourself out here, trying to have a good time, but also like, you know, hustling. I don't know. It's like, you know, it's, it's nice to be, to be rewarded with support, um, in, in any way that you can. So that's cool. Uh, for those of you listening today, again, all the stuff's on Comic Book Herald, uh, be kind to those around you just in general, but also here, especially in the chat. And you can find all this, you know, as a podcast version as well on Comic Book Herald. So if you go to CBH and you find the Comic Book Herald podcast, you know, these are released every week in podcast form too. So you don't have to catch them here live. Um, Let's see, Joel says, you sang John Cage 433. Is that is that something I have done previously? I've sang, I've sang Paris 1919 several times. Am I now singing Cage's uh, <laughs> 433, or is that a recommendation? I'm Hit asks, new Yeti mic. No, it's not new. This is what I've been using for streaming for a minute. I, I've got, I'll tell you what, like, I'm definitely the kind of, I'm not good at tech. I think I think if you've been following the the CVH channel for any period of time, you know this. Uh, I like as as low frills as possible. I have a more advanced microphone. I was never able. Oh, we could do Texas Hold'em by Beyonce. I could do that. I'm ready to go on that right now. Um, I have never been able to like figure out the new mic in the ways that I wanted, especially for live streams. So I've been using the blue blue Yeti which I was gifted actually for live streams for some time. Um, and it, it picks up sound great. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a little, a little chunky <clears throat> at times when I get excited, especially, you know, but that's going to happen. Uh, okay. Keep the nominations for songs coming. I'm seeing some good ones come in. Let's do it. Let's get into this. I think I'm seeing here. Jolton says fall of house of X was an excellent issue. I'm I'm guessing you mean the X Men issue that came out today, because there was not a fall of the House of X issue, as far as I'm aware. But I am pretty checked out on that series. So <laughs> if I if I just missed it, please somebody say something, and I would love to hear some more. What's a good? All right. So inevitably, inevitably, I'm going to do a post game, a Krakoa post game in May with Ernie from Blurred Without Fear. You know, inevitably, we're going to have to do one final post-game live show recap about the end of this all. Um, what song should we open with? And can I get Ernie to sing with me? <laughs> those are those are the two challenges. What should we end with for the, you know, is it is it a Sinatra, I did it my way? Is it uh, is it it's something else entirely? You know, do we not go with an old classic? Do we celebrate what was instead of honing in on it being an ending? So many options. Getting your nominations there as well. And I will take note. Uh, one thing I do 
I don't need to speak to, but I want to. I was off social media for like a week and a half. Uh, you know, I wasn't here last week. We we're doing stuff and it was great. I highly, highly recommend it. <laughs> like, like check out from social as often as you can. It's a good time. Um, I came back this week to see that, you know, Ed Persker had, had taken his own life. Um, cartoonist, uh, cartoonist Fick Kayfabe was a YouTube channel here that I was one of my first favorites. Um, creator of books like Hip Hop Family Tree, uh, X-Men Grand Design. All this seemed to be in response to recent allegations of improper behavior um, with underage girls in particular. Uh, he wrote a harrowing, upsetting suicide note. I guess that's that's really the only kind. Um, but this this felt felt you know definitely a, a, an extended version of that. Uh, it calls out the mob mentality of social media, calling out instigators by name. It, it's the whole thing is beyond awful. My heart breaks for his his family and friends. Uh, basically, I bring this up to say I don't have a take. You don't have to pick sides on this, although of course that's what a lot of people are doing. Um, predictably, it's become victims versus man driven to suicide by, you know, cancel culture. You don't have to pick. You know, two things are bad. Victimizing women in the ways that were alleged is is awful. And there's a long, gross history of it in comics specifically that that should be called out and accounted for and improved. A human being driven to take their own life is a tragedy. Two things can be true. You don't have to pick one to weaponize for your party stance. You don't have to try and win. You know, there aren't winners in something like this. A suicide is a tragedy, and it's going to be harder than ever for women to speak out safely in comics. There aren't winners here. So prayers to the man's family and, and peace to those who spoke up. And, you know, the reason I address it is it's definitely the biggest thing that happened in the comics community this week. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a topic of conversation and attention for a long time. And, uh, it's brutal. It is. It definitely is. Um, so anyway, that, that'd be my, my one thing that I'm trying to hold to. And probably for a lot of you is just like, you don't have to like try to argue a win on something like this or use it, you know, to, to bully other people <laughs> like anyway i don't know that there's a clear lesson i i don't know that there will be it's all pretty gross all right um so that's that let's give it a moment and let's talk about the week's comics getting your questions getting your thoughts i will address them Okay, I want to start with Ultimate Spider-Man number three. I know that's not what's on the screen. It'll come. I don't have time to. Actually, I do. Why, why can't I? Could I could do this right? So what do I? I push this button, maybe. Nope, that didn't work. How about this? What about now? Oh, too far. Uh, yeah, look at that. Look at that. What a technical wizard. Ultimate Spider-Man number three came out last week it's great <laughs> Marco Chiquetto is is one of Marvel's best uh like by by a lot <laughs> he's a really great fit on Ultimate Spider-Man I I had talked in the first couple issues you know in reviews and in criticism about like is does this series have like a second gear right is there a big secret coming or you know is there going to be some sort of elevation of what spider-man can be or how hickman's going to be using this alternate universe that may still come you know but i think at this point it is it is kind of comforting to just settle into like yeah but what if just like two of the best superhero comics creators just made great like classic spidey <laughs> like what if that happened and as it turns out it's pretty comforting it's a read i look forward to it is very enjoyable it's not special best in the game kind of comic stuff you know um and i think wanting that for 
for soups is kind of always where I'm, my head's going to go. Um, it's not even doing, you know, Ultimate X-Men through one issue and, and the trajectory it seems to be on is way more inventive, is way bolder in its ambition. Um, but that may come. And again, if it doesn't, then all we're going to be left with is like for a whole new generation of readers, this is going to be the Spider-Man book they love. And that's that's good. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Um, it's, it's very much what Bendis and Bagley's Ultimate Spider-Man was for so many readers and well after its run. You know, a lot of readers will still go back to that and be like, this is this is my Spider-Man or, you know, this is my favorite Spider-Man run, right? Ultimate Spider-Man can have that impact, especially like semi-early in, you know, kind of a superhero fandom experience. And Ultimate Spider-Man is going to be that for the next generation of readers, you know, or it has that potential, certainly. So I think rather than lament like, well, there doesn't really seem to be a big twist or there doesn't really seem to be anything especially surprising about this. Um, maybe it'll come, maybe it won't, you know, but for now I'm pretty content just to say like, this is just good, clean Spidey comics. And honestly, in some ways, like one of the most surprising things Hickman could do is to just make good, clean Spidey comics. <laughs> like that's actually kind of not what people go to him for. Or expect, you know, I think maybe there was a lot of expectation because of X-Men and because House and Powers were such knockouts that like, oh, this is going to launch with some crazy multiverse stuff and, you know, there's going to be Spideys in every costume and it's like, or he's just trying on costumes in front of his young daughter and it's super sweet and funny and a little inside baseball humor for Scarlet Spider costume fans, right? And like, and that's all it is. Um, but it's well done and it's well paced. I did not see the ending coming either you know I didn't see the whole Harry Pete not that I didn't see Harry as the Green Goblin obviously we kind of knew that was coming um, but I didn't see them like you know getting masks off I didn't see what seemed to be Harry identifying you know what Pete's costume is made of like he identifies the material seems like he maybe got some symbiote iconography in the design there um, so that's got potential that's interesting. The Jonah and Ben running their own newspaper thing is like a nice beat of comedy, a nice little change of pace. It's a good book. You know, um, I, I do, I do want, it, the main reason I want it to like, partially because I'm impatient and, and just want to spend my time reading the best things, <laughs> right? So there's that selfish thing. But the other piece of it is like, I just genuinely don't know if Hickman and Chiquetto are going to be on this book that long, you know? And if they're going to do 12 issues, like I want to, I want to see big stuff. So but again, like if it's super straightforward and they only do 12 issues, that's going to feel... I think, um, unsatisfying, but as it is like, I mean, you can literally do a lot worse <laughs> with Spider-Man comics, you know, you cannot do better. And the ultimate universe again is like in really great shape. Ultimate Spider-Man is rock solid. Ultimate X-Men is fascinating. Ultimate Black Panther has a lot of potential and the ultimate series from Dennis Camp and company looks awesome. So the Ultimate Universe is still in awesome shape. I'm excited about where that's at with Marvel. It's definitely the thing at Marvel right now that I'm interested in. You know, um, I'm a little confused about the strategy. You know, it's like, are you, it feels it feels a little bit like it's trying to do two things at once, which I think I would prefer a more coherent strategy. It kind of feels like you have, you have multiple you only have four books that are announced, right? And only three that have been released. But it's like, are you catering to sort of a just cleanest version of a new MCU crowd in comics? 
or are you trying like totally new, like black label, what if ask kind of concepts? And it feels like it's kind of like a little too stuck in the middle on that front. I'd rather it was the second, certainly rather the latter, but like that's, that comes from having read too many comics probably in some ways. So it's, it's good. I mean, it's good. I don't think it's great. But sometimes good is, is good enough. What are your ultimate Spider-Man thoughts? Get them in here in the comments. We'll definitely speak to them. I do wonder if, like, is fandom over the moon about this? Is fandom, like, getting impatient? Curious what the what the general reaction is. So get in your thoughts here. I'm going to take a sip of water. For those of you who joined in on time, I did start quite early today, got a bit of a cold, and I don't know how long my voice is going to hold out. So I wanted to get going while the hot water and honey was fresh in my gullet, and we're going to keep on plowing through. So getting your thoughts, getting your questions. We got a song nomination, Simple Minds, Don't You Forget About Me. That seems in in um, reflection of the end of the Krakoa era. Don't forget about the Krakoa era. I don't think it's going to come up a lot. <laughs> I do think there's going to be, there will be brief a brief transition period, but I don't think it's going to like really linger just because generally that's that's not, like Marvel Comics, they, they move on. And they don't necessarily reference things until some writer will find it of interest and, and call back to it, but probably it'll be a few years before they start doing it heavily. I mean, like Jed McKay today in the Avengers Fallout was like, yeah, I'm going to reference Avengers The Initiative during Secret Invasion. That was a 2009, <laughs> you know? So, like, the stuff always gets called back. I just don't think it's going to be... I, I don't think... They're, they're going to want to separate themselves from Krakoa, um, if you couldn't tell that already. So it's definitely, it's definitely going to keep happening. Let's see. Um... Pepto says, Spidey fandom seems so topic, so toxic, I avoid it hard. Yeah, I guess I don't, I didn't really mean, like, what does Spider-Man fandom think of? I think fandoms in general suck. <laughs> like, like anyone, it, in the sense that, like, fandom and sort of, like, really cultivating a, a dedicated, like, I am a part of this group of this, you know, almost mob of, of people who have these very angry, specific things that we need for our one focus. I just, I just don't understand tying yourself in, boxing yourself in to a fandom. Like a, like a fandom that isn't based on quality, to me, is absurd. Um, but I've talked about this before, but that's literally all sports fans, right, are are exactly that. So yes, like my sports fandom, it, it's absurd. I recognize that absurdity, right? It is absurd that for the first, whatever, 30 years of my life, the Chicago Cubs generally sucked, <laughs> but I rooted for them. You know, it's absurd that I've never seen the Bears win a Super Bowl and may never. Actually, that's probably going to change very soon. I'm very excited about this upcoming draft. Should we talk Bears? We could talk Bears for a while. I'll tell you what. Zach and I, on my marvelous year, said there should be a Bears on Bears podcast. If any of y'all out there are Bears, like like in like slang, and you're also Bears fans, Chicago Bears football, get a pod started, and I will promote the hell out of it. I will promote Bears on Bears with my dying breath. Okay? That's my request for you today to all the bears out there. Anyway, talking sports, talking comics. Where were we? I generally don't remember. <laughs> okay. All doing Spider-Man, pretty fun. Vass says, like, getting back to basics with a twist. Yeah, that, that's what it is, right? That's what it is. It's like, it's it's quite simple, but it is twisty enough that it feels, you know, just a half step to the left from what we've seen before. Uh, Rise of the Powers of Ten was a big one. 
issue number three came out this last week. I've been very pro Rise of the Powers of Ten. I've been very appreciative of what Karen Gillan and R.B. Silva have been able to do in actually making uh, an, a concluding X-Men event that is at least ambitious enough to try to be worthy of the start, right, of House and Powers. Uh, I don't think issue three quite measured up to that to the level of the first two for me. Uh, I definitely, you know, it, it fe- it's feeling the urgency now. I think it's feeling the challenges of tying up something like this in in like such a, a seemingly rushed, but like I don't know, just unsupported period of time is what it feels like. The things that we learned in Rise of Powers are Trickster Titan from Inferno. Remember that? Remember in Inferno, Mega Sentinel was like, I was sent back by a Trickster Titan. We all theorized about who that could be and what that could mean. And how cool is that? It was just the same Sinister Dominion. He poses a Trickster Titan, which is a classic. I don't know if this is actually what happened, but to me, it seemed to be a classic this is how I solve a continuity gaff thing, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense for the Enigma Sinister Dominion to have posed as a trickster titan. Why? Why do that thing? <laughs> I think, it, you know, it's purely because Gillen referenced it elsewhere. I forget exactly where. And said it was a a Dominion or a Titan, but he used like the wrong terminology. And then people are like, oh no, Hickman said a trickster Titan. And now here we have him saying, ah, aha, here's how we square that circle. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's another thread that doesn't really pay off is the way it is really all it means, right? It's like, all right, Enigma Sinister is behind everything. Yep, sure. Okay, yep, that's the story here. Um, Enigma's in a timeline and he's trying to get Moira to join Enigma, so the Big E has access to Moira's lifelines. So, Sinister Enigma, aka the Sinister Dominion, right now has access to all time and space in like the main Marvel continuity timeline. Does not have access to Moira's extended lifelines. Okay, so he's trying to make a deal with Moira, and he's like, listen, you can get what you want. You can live forever, as I think he promises her, like, as, like, a Titan system, basically, like, an AI system within me, within the Dominion, if you join me and then I can get access to the, to the lifelines. And now the Dominion can spread, is basically how I interpreted this. Um, Moira's entire deal at this point is boiled down to just, like, I just want to live forever. So she's like pretty game. She's pretty game. Um, Charles Xavier, meanwhile, in the Rise of the Powers of Ten crew, he he goes back in time. A lot of people were freaked out when the plan was announced, and they're like, oh, we got to go back and kill Moira as a child. A lot of people were freaked out. Like, are they going to undo Krakoa? Are they going to reset the entire Marvel timeline? It has been very clear that was not going to happen for a variety of reasons, but I think the clearest reason you can tell that was never going to happen is that this event is very deeply unsupported, (laughs) right? So, like, you're not actually going to have a full-on Marvel continuity reset for an event that has been relegated to just get this over with status, before we can launch our new X-Men thing that that everyone actively working at Marvel seems to be much more excited about. You know, it's like, so Charlie doesn't kill Child Moira, which congrats to Charlie on that one. Um, he does implant some sort of little psychic kiss, some sort of little psychic something that Charlie leaves behind in Child Moira. This will come up again. This is going to go somewhere. What did he leave behind? It's a little bit of his own psyche, and he can take over the Dominion. It's a nice nice development for the Charles is going to be the Dominion crowd. Right? 
Um, what could it be? Is it a reminder of who she was? I don't know. Something like I mean, Karen Gillan's a very smart, <laughs> very good comic storyteller. I hope it's not, you know, the power of love <laughs> kind of thing. I don't think we're going that direction, but there's something there. That's that's ultimately going to be the out, I think, for how Moira um, maybe pushes back against the Dominion in the end. It's pretty unclear to me kind of like what the next two issues may hold in Rise of the Power of Ten. So when they get back to the spaceship, the Powers of Ten crew, Charles hasn't killed Moira. Just gave her a little psychic kiss. It's revealed that Doug is actually a sinister. Rasputin the fourth freaks and kills him. Rachel's mad that Charles lied to her, which Rachel, come on, girl. And uh, and then Charles shoots Rachel in the back, which was actually surprising. That I don't know what that like. I I truly have no idea what that was about. So I'm curious what the next two issues may hold. I mean, we are teasing the hell out of some Phoenix action. It's repeatedly said by Enigma here that, like, Omega Sentinel's problem in the timeline where I had to send her back in time was the Phoenix. We've got Gene perceived as dead, but we know to be in the White Hot Room with the rest of the gang from Immortal X-Men. I mean, Phoenix action is coming. It how and where I mean the next two issues <laughs> I bet you that I'm curious to see how that plays out um, but yeah this one wasn't my favorite of the bunch so far but definitely like I mean I'm still very much here to read the, the rest of Rise of the Powers of Ten what y'all think Chris asks where's my Dougie a very good and frankly important question what are Doug and Krakoa up to just snugging, just snuggling like bugs <laughs> while all this goes down. That's an acceptable answer, right? Everything looks terrible. Sometimes you just want to cuddle up with your pal. I get that. Justin says, rise sounds awful. <laughs> I do think I've seen, or maybe I just suspect, it, it feeling very confused. I felt this issue was a bit confusing. Um, I would say prior to this point, I would definitely would have defended an apparent confusion and be like, no, this is, this is all very much rooted in what was built. And if you've been hyper obsessed with the Krakow air on the cosmic side, like this, this generally checks out. This issue was definitely like, okay, we're moving fast enough now that like the wheels aren't, the wheels are like just a little bit above the tracks. Like, we're not, like, flipping off into, like, a Donkey Kong, you know, like, pit in the mine. But, uh, but like, we're, you know, it, it might happen. <laughs> it could happen by the end. Um, it's, it's the best thing happening in X-Men comics right now. But, yeah, I mean, it's in danger of falling off the tracks for sure. It's a really tricky, tricky balancing act. Justin asks, any Bay the Blood Moon? When was the last time we saw Bay the Blood Moon? I have no idea. Truly none. Chris says, if Moira is the greatest miss of the Krakow era, which, yes, absolutely, Doug is the second, in my opinion. I think Doug is... I, Doug actually had a very good Krakoa. I think when we're doing our who had a good Krakoa power rankings, like, this was a great, a great era for Doug. I think the only way that Doug is a miss is if you subscribe to the theory that Doug was, like, maybe the ultimate enemy or one of the biggest players in the Hickman version of the story, then it's like, okay, yeah, we didn't get there. That's where I see it. But otherwise, Doug had a really good Krakoa. Like prior to this, prior to this era, Doug Ramsey had grown a, a sadness beard and literally become addicted to the internet. He wasn't doing better. <laughs> tell you that. Uh, Ultimate Power says, I see X shot Rachel because she'd be a burden in his current ways of doing things. Then why did he bring her onto the team? You know? Like, why Why even have a team? Could have just been him and Sinister. 
maybe he just needed them. I guess the argument would be like just to get to that point and fend off the weird Dominion Matrix attacks while they're doing that, and now he has no need for them anymore. I guess maybe that's how you how you justify that. James asks, was the Avengers Fall of X tie-in fun? Anyone? Uh, I mean, it's exactly what you'd think it would be. It's Iron Man saying, Avengers, let's go help the X-Men. And they fight a bunch of Sentinels. And I promise you I'm not underselling that. Um, it is executed reasonably well, I guess. But like, I'm not going to hand sell you that one. <laughs> Speaking of comics that I might hand sell someone, God's number six. Easily the coolest issue of God's. I think. I don't think it's especially close. I do quite appreciate, and it's been kind of underutilized, but I think Valerio Schiti's designs for the cosmic entities are really strange and shifting, and they're way less anthropomorphic than, you know, the Starlin verse. That's pretty cool. I, I The Living Tribunal design is like, I, it feels like it should feel with a cosmic entity like this, where I'm like, I don't really know what that is. I look at it, and I know that I'm looking at it, but my brain is kind of like, I don't know what I'm looking at. And it feels like that's how a basic human like myself, call myself basic, a lot of self-loathing in that statement, um, should perceive the living tribunal. But like this issue was cool. It made me think in some ways, like this is, you know, what this series, I don't know that it's like living up to its potential, but it's kind of like, okay, like I can see the threads of potential here. But again, we're six days of the way through now, and I still don't really know why this book is, you know, um, for that being a journey to the living tribunal story was really kind of understated the tribunal's actual like role and impact and that sort of thing. I, the book, the mark, it's hard to shake marketing from intent, but like this book actually doesn't need to have anything to do with the cosmic pantheon. If I hadn't gone into it with that, expectation and hope I think it would just be like I don't know I'd be less disappointed by it and more just like oh, okay like it's it's magic users in the Marvel Universe that we haven't learned before I'm a little more open to that I still wouldn't love it but I feel like I'd be less disappointed by it um I it, again it's kind of just impossible for me to shake that like because the book is it has a toe in Marvel continuity waters, but just a toe. It's kind of its own thing. And it's just like, it's so easy to find comics, to find better comics. Like, it's really easy. <laughs> and that stands out when you're kind of not beholden to like, oh yeah, but this is part of the Marvel universe and I'm super pot committed to that, you know? Um, but yeah, like this, this issue was cool. You know, it, it had that classic kind of like riddles and supernatural beings. And, you know, something's going to go bad. The second the wolf is like, you don't know me now. It's like, all right, that's coming back. You know, living tribunal looks cool as hell. Oblivion is mysterious. This issue had potential. I just, it's not going to be a run. I recommend to anyone by the time it's done. You know, it's definitely not. Um, I can't pretend that it is. But at least, at least now I'm kind of like, okay, it's having moments. It's definitely having moments. Um, it's a weird project. It really is. You know? Like, it, if you wipe my memory and were like, and, and sent me back in time and then gave me this book and we're like, oh, yeah, it's written by, and like you inserted like any Marvel standby, I'd, I'd believe you. Like, there's not a lot about this book to me that feels like, oh, yeah, this is Jonathan Hickman, like somebody who carved out a space as like one of my favorite comics writers over the last, you know, 14 years plus. Like, that's where it's weird for me, I think. But yeah, 
that's the God's experience. I'm, I'm, I have to admit, like, I'm very curious. Like, what does a finale look like for this book? Like, what is even the story? <laughs> like, what are, what are they going towards? It's a genuine question. Somebody explain it. All right, big old sip of water. I did have to laugh. X-Force number 50 came out last week. It is the final issue in the 50-issue run of X-Force, written by Benjamin Percy, art frequently by Josh Kassara. Today we had Robert Gill, who was on a bunch of the series. 50 issues of X-Force. More creators should have the runway to put together 50 issues of comics. That is a great thing. That is a great thing. I saw often the def a defense of X-Force being like Ben Percy is writing in a novelistic style. And you need to be patient with it because he's writing like a novel. So this is a little condescending, I think, as defenses go. But here's the thing about novels. <laughs> Just because they're novels doesn't mean they end well. Doesn't mean they build the satisfying conclusions. I like, don't love a lot of what's in X-Force. I think the general overarching commentary on like the flaws of trying to build a mutant CIA, there was always promise in that. And I think ultimately the run does like without saying it explicitly, is kind of like, I, I don't know that it's, its points are made very effectively, honestly, but I think there is a clear undercurrent of when you try to build mutant defense, there's a lot of flaws in, in nation building and nation defending, right? That, that's a very ripe thing to criticize and to comment on. Okay. I do think it pinned too much of the flaws in that approach on Beast's descent into evil and darkness. This issue ends with a revived, young, fresh, happy Beast trying to talk his old evil self out of his Bondian black hole gun, <laughs> which was going to shoot all the mutants of Mars into a, into a black hole. And then once he had personally wiped out Orcus, he was going to bring him back. I'm not like, I'm not like horrified by that plan. If I'm being honest, um, it's a very unsatisfying conclusion. <laughs> like, like, and not only is it unsatisfying, because like, all right, we've been building to Beast has been evil for feels like a hundred years now, and somebody's got to stop him and take him down. Okay, like we've set the stage for that. He needs his comeuppance. <sighs> That, that build to that was so long that I think they missed the window for any kind of satisfying conclusion. You know? Like, there were moments, maybe around the late 30s, where it was like, if you put Beast on trial for what he's done, like, that would have had weight. <laughs> you know? There were moments where Krakoa was still before the fall, where it was like, yeah, you can still build to like this having some sort of satisfying conclusion and the comeuppance that this character deserves and then possibly a resurrection arc, you know, by the end. And this book just never really seemed especially interested in that. You know, it's really, uh, it's really just like the longest, like it just really stretched out its one idea. I guess is the way to say it. <laughs> like it just stretched it so far and so long. And then hilariously, the part that I had to laugh at, somehow this last issue was rushed? <laughs> How did that happen? It's issue 50. We've been building to this forever. Literally for five years. And then like the last two pages are like, Oh, the beast got shot into space. Everyone's gathered around a table. And, uh, well, guess that's over now. Bye. 
It was so fast. It was a very strange ending. You can't, you cannot, you cannot give the excuse of, of the X office being rushed and everybody thought they had more time with this one. This was always issue 50. We've been building to these threads for years. I mean, wild. Wild to me. I wish I wish there had been more to it. Not like more comics, but just like... Because I think all the ideas and all the setup is like good stuff. Like I think Percy setting all this up was in like on a really good track. With where Beast was going, with how flawed this X-Force team would be, with Colossus and the whole like Russian manipulation. And just I don't think any of those paid off well at all. You know, and I think if you're going to play the, like, I'm very pro creators getting a chance to play the long game, right? I think it's cool, like, to let more creators get the chance to play the long game. But the problem with that, of course, is, like, that's a hard game to play. There are not a lot of creators you look at in the current comics landscape, especially because the opportunities are so rare, where you'd be like, they are really good at building to payoffs and sticking landings, right? Like Hickman gets that rep for his Marvel Universe through Secret Wars. Al Ewing has moments. Um, Gillen hasn't done it on the superhero side, really. And creator-owned, yeah. Chad McKay hasn't had the opportunity yet. Um, Chip Zdarsky. Chip Zdarsky pulled it off on Daredevil, actually. There's an example where I'll give credit. Somebody who got to do a long run, built to a lot of satisfying conclusions, <laughs> right? I think I think you give credit there. <sighs> Anybody else come to mind? I'm like the Marvel mainstays. And again, some of this is opportunity. You have to have the at-bat to be able to do that. But it's a short list. Dan Slott, I guess, depending on how you feel about the way that Spidey run ended. I'm going to give it to Dan. I'm not, like, number one fan A for that Spidey run, but, like, there's a lot of good stuff in there. And a lot of builds and a lot of setup and lackluster moments, yeah, but if you do the thing for 55 years, you're going to have lackluster periods. I mean, the reality, too, is, like, not every run needs to be 50 issues. You know, I don't know that you'd want Karen Gillen's Eternals for 50 issues because he doesn't want to do it for that long, right? Like, you have to have, like, the creator has to want to be doing that. Otherwise, it's going to feel like a really, Matt Fraction talks about this a lot, actually. I was talking about reading all the sex criminals recently, and he writes in the back of the book how, like, you know, at various points, he was like, I don't really want to write this book. I don't want it to be what it was. And he's like, the better thing, like, you could do that and just pump out issues month after month, but the audience is going to feel that you're not invested yourself. And it's like, in, in big two comics, right, in corporate comics, like, the, they don't have, the, Percy doesn't have the luxury or the option to be like, you know what, it'd actually be better if I stepped away for four months and we left this sit and let, let me cook and come back with a better idea. You don't have that luxury in corporate comics, right? You don't get to do that. It has to just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. So, I mean, it's absolutely a feat, I think. I mean, that's why, like, Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk is such a a modern rarity. Or even Cates and Stegman on Venom. Good long runs that, like, have, like, a, a relative level of consistency at a high quality. At the pace that they have to come out. Like, that's that's real hard stuff to pull off. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing it pointed out here. Jeff McKay did have a, a long Moon Knight run. That's a good point. That's a good point. So maybe you put Jeff in the conversation. Will he be able to do it on X-Men, though? Somebody asked about the Avengers issue. They did introduce the Sentinel factory that is going to be the base of the X-Men in the new, uh, new X-Men era. So I guess if you're super jazzed about that, <laughs> you have that to look forward to. Um, but, yeah, no, you should give, you should put, we can put Jeff on the list for that Moon Knight, which is quite good um, from start to finish. I mean, that's why, you know, 
that's why Jack gets the at bats on Avengers and uh, and is going to get X Men. You know. But yeah, X Force Fifty did not. It did not have it. I'd be curious if anyone disagrees. Honestly, like even if you really liked the run, I would, did this feel like a good conclusion? <laughs> I thought it was comically abrupt. All right. I think the only other comic that came out today that I'm interested in talking about is Immortal Thor number nine. Immortal Thor has been a difficult one to review and talk about, you know, at the cadence that it's coming out because the book feels, you know, we're getting deep into this run now and it's kind of like, what, what is this book? How does it, how does it fit this immortal theme? Of Ewings, does it even? Why is he writing in thought bubbles and old timey Thor narration? <laughs> you know, um, today felt like it cracked some cracked some windows. Like today felt like it it opened it up a little bit into what it actually is. It's Thor versus comics in a lot of ways, and. That's really great. I mean, I love meta commentary on on comics in general. You put a comic within a comic, I just about lose my pants. Like it is, <laughs> it is the coolest stuff. Um, and that's what a, the Mortal Thor is doing. We've been seeing how Enchantress and Executioner and Jerry Auger, the CEO of Roxxon, have been reading Thor comics. And like using story magic, which is a big thing throughout this, to sort of manipulate or control what Thor's doing. And now they're they're using so in the Marvel universe, the Fantastic Four and like the Avengers and maybe others have licensed out their likeness to have comics of them created in the Marvel universe. So these aren't the comics we read, but in the Marvel universe, there are comic books of these characters who are actual superheroes in that world. This is something that's established very early on by Stanley the Manly and Jack Kirby in Fantastic Four. And Al is using that to be like, Thor, you've licensed yourself out, and that allows for our story magic and Roxxon's corporate, you know, capitalistic ideology to, like, control you. Like, you're our property. You're our content is the big theme of this one. Immortal Thor is definitely a lot more directly confrontational, I think, about about modern topics, right? About IP, about the way corporations abuse that, about climate change. Like, that's all interwoven in this issue and last issue. I don't remember... I guess Immortal Hulk actually had a lot of commentary on, like, destruction of the earth and, and climate change and, and the green and all that. That was there, now that I think about it. Um, but yeah, it's like, so now it's like Thor versus corporate comics, which again, like Al Ewing's doing this from within the house. Like Al Ewing is doing, like the call is coming from inside the house. He's writing a Thor comic for Marvel owned by Disney. And he's calling out things like corporations exploiting IP and only doing it for the content. <laughs> you know, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild stuff. I'm I'm fascinated by this book. I still don't know that I love it. But I'm like I'm into it. I I definitely want to read every issue. But it is it is strange. It is difficult. I mean, I think Al is He's playing with the goodwill that was established by Immortal Hulk. You know? Like, he's definitely... He's definitely spending that goodwill. You know? Because I think if you're into Immortal Thor at this point, it's kind of like... It's a lot of faith. It's a lot of trust that Al's going to be able to take you home. And we're nine issues in, and... I, I can't promise that this is landing somewhere, you know, um, but I'm very interested to see. <laughs> I've seen the question, 
do I like Immortal Thor or not? It's hard to answer, actually. I like Al Ewing, and I'm excited to read each next issue. But do I actually think it's like a great, like, you got to read this run? Not yet. <laughs> Maybe it'll get there. Let's see. I'm seeing here in the chat that Silver Surfer is going to be a girl. Is that, <laughs> is that the casting news of the day? I'm sure that will bother a lot of people who never think about the Silver Surfer under any other <laughs> circumstances. Uh, I would say makes a lot of sense. Why not? I hope that movie's good. I'm not ready to call Mortal Thor mid. No, I'm definitely not there. Like, Gods is mid. Gods is, like, aggressively mid. Uh, Mortal Thor is way more interesting than that. All right. I think we talked about all the comics today. What else do you all want to talk about? I have not watched any of the most recent X-Men 97 episodes. I suspect I will watch many of them all at once. If you have any strong X-Men 97 thoughts, share them here, I guess, as long as they aren't. If anything actually surprising happens, I don't want to be spoiled, but if it's just like, here's how Inferno goes, like, yeah, I know. Like, that's fine. I will not, it, I don't know, are people still, are people as high on the 97 experience as everybody seemed to be after the first two? I definitely felt, you know, the, the, the heavy, heavy lays the crown of the, cranky old guy who's not feeling X-Men 97. <laughs> you know, um, the, the first two issues, like episodes, I was definitely, definitely on an island, I think, of folks who were just not like over the moon with praise. But I'm curious what people think as, as it continues. I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to watch them. James says, Rick Remender stuck the landing with Uncanny X-Force. I'm talking, I'm talking recent. I'm talking modern. Many creators throughout comics history have stuck landings. I'm talking like people that are regular writers at Marvel now when I make that list. Because their rotation's pretty consistent. I mean, again, like when we were predicting who's going to be on X-Men stuff, it's like, yeah, Jed McKay's like, you know, he gets books from Marvel's right now. He gets books from Marvel right now. Like it's a, it's a rotation of like, I don't know, like 12 people at least on the writer side. <laughs> yeah, I saw I saw Life Death was was um was going to be adapted here. <sighs> Is it controversial as an X-Men fan? To just just ask the question. Is Life Death good? Or do you just like Barry Windsor Smith? I'm just asking questions. Is there anything more annoying than that guy? That guy that I'm being right now? Barry Windsor Smith's X-Men comics are phenomenal. It's like you're, it's a great run and you have all these like just knockout superhero folks. You know, Paul Smith and Byrne and Claremont and John Romita Jr. But then Barry Windsor Smith jumps in. He's just like, holy, what? <laughs> If somebody can do this in comics, but you know, it's all, it's sporadic, right? You get the life death stuff. You get, what is it? Wolverine or uh, that uncanny, is it 204, 205? The Wolverine in the snow one, the lady death strike just like decimates him. And the, the one of the power pack kids is there. Oh man, that issue's so good. Is life death actually that good though? I'm just asking questions. It's been a long time. It's been a while since I've read it. I would read it again. I remember thinking, Storm's cool as hell. Barry Windsor Smith's great. This comic's a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> These are insane things to say out loud into a microphone when you haven't read the comic recently. Let's see. Bird Nerd says, episode four says, yes, enjoy nostalgia, but we are going to shake the status quo. Okay. Okay, that has me excited. 
actually. Chris says, three was very pretty, but they rushed. I won't spoil it, but they rushed a story in one episode. They did the whole thing in one episode? That's wild, actually. I could see that going wrong, but I'm also kind of excited about that. Honestly. That, that seems crazy to do that in one episode. No, you need you need at least a little a little Matty build, right? All right, I gotta watch this. I'm telling you, my kids are are they enjoy nothing more than not watching X Men with me. It's like you never want to seem like you you want to seem cool, right? Just in general, but you want to seem removed from your kids' interests. Like if I'm too desperate to do something with them. That's the last thing that they're going to do. And I'm clearly so desperate to watch X-Men 97 with them that they're all just like toying with me, just like brutally shutting me down. Like my wife will be like, no more TV today. And they'll have fits. They'll lose their minds. And I come up, I'm like, who wants to watch X-Men 97? If I said any other TV show in the world, it'd be the nicest thing I've ever done and my wife would, not speak to me for the rest of the night because <laughs> it'd be super rude to ignore what she said. Um, but when it's X-Men, they're like, nah, we're good. We're good, dog. Oh, it's brutal. It's brutal. Uh, Pigs, he asked, did anyone read X-Men 97 number one, a canon prelude? And Bernard says, yes, it was good. I got to tell you, I'm not... I'm not in that space where I'm going to be reading an X-Men 97 prelude, but I'm glad to hear some people are enjoying it. I can't believe they did the they did that story in one episode. Wow. Inferno's pretty good, y'all. I'm seeing some Inferno slander here. Inferno's like one of the best Marvel events of the 80s. Like, the build to Inferno and then the actual event itself. I mean, yeah, if you're counting, like, every tie-in with Daredevil fighting... Actually, Daredevil fighting the Vacuum Cleaner is great. I'm referencing that like it's not my favorite thing. Um, if you're referencing all the demon tie-ins and stuff, sure. But, like, Inferno's a really good event. It's actually... It's, pro it's one of the best Marvel events of all time. I feel comfortable saying that. You know, top of my head, the list is what? Secret Wars. Uh, Infinity Gauntlet is in the conversation. I don't know about Annihilation right now. I got to tell you, it's the first one that popped in my head. I had a good time rereading it recently, but if you listen to the My Marvel This Year podcast, where we go through the history of Marvel Comics from its origins to today, we had a, we had a throwdown, Zach and Charlotte and I. They were not feeling Annihilation nearly as much as I was. Sorry, our biggest fight since the Mutant Massacre. Mutant Massacre is not on this list of the best Marvel events of all time. What else is in the conversation? Yeah, I mean, Inferno is easily on this list. Inferno is a top five Marvel event. Right? I don't know. Is, it, is that even, like, controversial? I, I'm still not really counting House and Powers as Marvel events. People like to be like, oh, it's an event, and it's not. It's not really, though. It's an X-Men book. <laughs> it's interesting here in the chat to see, I'm going to call you Albert Nerd because you do great comments here. Um, anyone take issue with, with one of the funniest things about Claremont's X-Men, which is after Gene dies as the Phoenix, that he moves to Alaska and falls in love and marries a woman who looks exactly like Jean. <laughs> like it's it's like all time like not it like not satire. You know, it's not like deliberate comedy. But in retrospect, it's like it's hilarious to consider someone actually doing that. You know? And then like he's far enough removed because it's Alaska that <laughs> that like there's really nobody there to like call him on that until it's too late. It is funny that, you know, probably, yeah, probably a lot of people watching this are like, it is very unbelievable. 
<laughs> that Scott would fall for a, the same woman. I, I don't know how they play it in Inferno too, because or in the in the ninety seven. I gotta watch it. All right, I'll watch it. I'll talk me into it. Uh, Chris gives the very wrong opinion here. The Mute Masker is way better than Inferno. Just want everyone to know that that is deeply inaccurate. And you gotta watch. You gotta watch out for misinformation these days. Um, it's a fire hose of falsehood out there in the world, and it's more dangerous than ever. And you're going to be misled by many, and that's an attempt right there to mislead you. Yeah, Voss says Hoxpox is top five. It would be if it was really an event. But sadly, it's not. All right, y'all. I think we did it. I think we made it. Yeah, the top Marvel events list isn't as big as you'd want it to be. <laughs> like, I'd actually have World War Hulk is in my top 10. I had a great time reading World War Hulk. Planet Hulk is not an event. Nobody submitted. Nobody nominated. That is not an event. What else is even on the list? Man, Infinity Crusade, or not Infinity Crusade, Infinity War is actually kind of underrated. Oh, Original Secret War. That's a top fiver for sure. Uh, what are the other 80s events? Acts of Vengeance, no. Executioner's Song is later, no. I'm not looking at anything, I'm just thinking. House of M, nah, no thank you. Civil War, no thank you. Dark Rain Solid, but not an event. Siege is actually like, pretty good but it's kind of hard to put it in that that territory what are the more modern ones King and Black started started, King and Black started great actually if we're just going the first two issues King and Black's on the list unfortunately it didn't hold Uh, Judgment Day was actually really well done seems weird to put a top 10 already but it might actually be there is there anything else recent that I'm forgetting Fall of the House of Axe obviously all right. Good job, everybody. I think we did. Age of Apocalypse. Thank you, Chris. Good golly. I forgot Age of Apocalypse. Shame on me. Shame. What about Messiah Complex? Truth Teller says. Uh, Messiah Complex is solid. Seems weird to put a top 10, though. You got to at least consider it. I will say, you do have to at least consider Messiah Complex. You got to write it down on the list, if only to cross it out. Boss says Dark Phoenix. Yeah, I wouldn't call Dark Phoenix an event either. You know, just like like a good just like a good story isn't an event. We gotta be protective of these very important definitions. Clearly. All right. I think we did it. Good job, everybody. I, th- I think I only coughed like five times. I think I muted myself every time too. I had to, I had to clear out the sinuses a couple times. I'm sure you all enjoyed that blast of cold virus air into the microphone. But the important thing is you're safe. The important thing is you are safe. Celestial Messiah Saga is not on this list. Thank you, Sean, for clarifying. Avengers vs. X-Men top one. I don't mind Avengers vs. X-Men. I'm not anti-AVX. But no, it's not on the list. Access is bottom five, for sure. Bottom five is... Civil War II, Fall of the House of X, Access, what else? I'm sure there's others that I'm blanking on. Infinity Crusade, for having the audacity to run that back a third time. And... I don't know. There's a lot that are just boring. I'm trying to think of ones that are like actively bother me. I don't know. Who's your bottom five? Get him in there. Let's talk bottoms. Thanks everybody for listening. As always, enjoy the comics. <laughs>